Well, good morning. Welcome to Life Spring Church. Hope you guys are doing well today. If you're new here, my name is Dylan. I'm one of the pastors on staff. Especially want to welcome you if it's either your first time uh, ever back in church or your first time um, in church in a long time. We are glad to have you today. Uh, real quick before we get going, um, next Sunday, July 2nd, we will not have our regularly scheduled uh, Sunday morning experience. Now, we will meet in the parking lot outside the lobby where you came in no later than 10 o'clock uh, next Sunday morning. I'll explain why in just a second. Um, but instead of having our regularly scheduled worship experience, we're actually going to go and do what we call Serve Sunday. So we'll be doing a couple different things. Uh, one of the things we'll do is we'll be going to the Women's Smithfield Rescue Mission and doing some maintenance on, in, or on their property so we can serve them. Um, another group will be going downtown and around town and just cleaning up some trash. And another group will just be praying over our community. And one of the reasons that we do this is because we have a conviction as a church uh, that we don't just want to do church or gather as a church. We want to be the church for the community. We don't want just to just be a church that's in Smithfield. We want to be a church that is for Smithfield um, and for our community, for the people here. Um, so next Sunday, be here no later than 10 o'clock. Um, and the reason you need to be here earlier than 10 is because if you go over to the Women's Smithfield Rescue Mission, you need to have somebody that you can actually follow there because we can't publish that address online because there are actually women there who are fleeing pursuers that have been abusive in the past. So be here next Sunday. If you have like um, a specific thing you'd like to contribute, like we need um, yard uh, work equipment, like weed whackers, chainsaws, that sort of thing, um, you can sign up for that or for any other specific role that you'd like to do at guest services or next steps. Uh, this morning. So you guys make sure to do that. Um, we've also got another team that will be in Washington, D.C. for our first mission trip. So we're excited about that. Um, so if you have a Bible and you want to follow along, we're going to be in Mark chapter 12 as we finish up this series called Skeptical. Uh, if you have a Bible, you can follow along. If not, Scripture will be on screen. And if you don't have a Bible because you don't own a Bible, just drop by Next Steps or Guest Services and they will give you a Bible for free. All of us at some point in our lives have had qu questions uh, that we would really like the answer to. For example, how many of y'all have ever wondered what a hot dog is made of? Show of hands. Show of hands. Come on, come on, come on. Now, how many of you don't care what a hot dog is made of? Yeah, that's me. That's me. I don't care. Like, like I, I prefer not as well too much on what uh, the byproducts of chicken or pork or beef is or like mechanically separated chicken, pork, or beef is. I just say, give me some chili, give me some cheese, and put it on a bun, and I will be happy. Um, so you may have had that question, especially if you're very, very health conscious. If you're a dude, then maybe you've had the question that was made popular by the Mel Gibson movie, what do women want? Because, and ladies, I'm not picking on you, I'm not picking on you, I'm going to get the minute in just a second, so just bear with me. The reason we have this question is because what you want changes often. See, all the men are laughing because here's, here's the reality, ladies. Like, 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 guys, you'll try something with your spouse one night, and it'll be just like magical, chemistry happens, magic happens, it's like the hallelujah course of angels breaks out over your home, and you're like, okay, I did some things right, and then you try the same thing the next night, and your wife is like, get your hands off of me. See, the guys are like, we know this is true. Now, ladies, 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 I hit the, I hit the guys, or I hit y'all, um, now I'm going to hit the guys. Ladies, maybe you've had the question of, how can my husband, or my boyfriend, or maybe even my brother or dad, sit two feet away from me? And literally not hear a word that I say. Ladies, how many of y'all have ever wondered that? Come on, come on. Yes, yes. Because you can like spend five minutes like pouring your heart out to your husband over this thing that happened. And then he's like, um, I'm sorry, what did you say? Because men have the, spiritually, the spiritual gift of being able to go deaf at any given time. I don't know how to explain it. It just kind of happens. My wife has joked with me that she um, has decided to, to just start having random conversations with me when I'm in zombie mode. And usually when she'll say something, I'll be like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Thankfully, she's never asked me for $1,000 because I'd probably be like, uh-huh. And then 10 minutes later, be like, wait, what did you ask for? Something like that. So, so, so those are kind of silly. We can kind of laugh about those questions, but for many, uh, for many of us at some point in our life, we've had much more serious questions that were very, very difficult and we maybe felt like we never got an answer to. Questions such as, man, if, if God is supposedly good, then how in the world can evil exist? If God is supposedly a loving God, how can he allow people that he supposedly loves to spend eternity separated from God in hell? If God really is good, then why does he let bad things happen to good people. 
Well, how in the world do I reconcile what the Bible says about creation versus what science seems to teach about evolution? If God really is good and God does not mis make mistakes, then why in the world did he make me or make a friend of mine with an attraction to someone of the same sex if God is good and God supposedly doesn't make mistakes? We've all had questions like that, and we'll be answering some of those specific questions, some I just mentioned, tomorrow on Facebook Live, 7 o'clock. Um, so if you'll go like our Facebook page, we'll spend like a little bit of time answering and delving into those questions. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and if you do have a question that you'd love answered, send it to hello at lifespringnc.com. We'd love to engage with you on that level. But we've all had questions like that, questions that were confusing for us, they were difficult for us. And so chances are, if you had this question or those questions or questions like that, as a teenager or an adult, chances are you probably found someone that you thought was a Christian and asked because you're like, well, they must have a direct line to God or something, so I'm going to ask them. And then you went and asked a Sunday school teacher or maybe a pastor or maybe a parent or a friend. And for many of you, you may have gotten an answer that went something like this. You just need to trust God, have faith, and believe the Bible. And that's a frustrating answer. Because it leaves you with nothing. It leaves you with no answers. And there's several reasons why it would have frustrated you or frustrated me. First off, it communicates that Christianity is nothing more than blind faith. And therefore, it's not that you don't want to believe. It's just that no one really seems to have a good reason for doing so. Another reason why it may have frustrated you is because it communicated to you that maybe the faith of your childhood that you held on to when you were 8, 9, or 10 could not stand up to the questions that you had as you were growing into adulthood or as an adult. And the third reason that it frustrated you is because when you got that kind of pat Sunday school answer, it communicated to you that God was not interested in your questions, therefore he wasn't really interested in you, and all he really wanted you to do was sit down, shut up, and sing the songs and listen to the guy preach. And so for that reason, that may be why at some point in your life you stepped away from the faith, or why you've never come to faith to begin with. Now, I just want to say, if that's you, like I understand that reaction. And I'm not blaming you at all because chances are if I had received that sort of response to the questions I had as a teenager, I probably would have done what you did. I probably would have either stepped away or never stepped into faith to begin with. So I'm not blaming you. I understand where you're coming from. But with that in mind, let me ask you this. If your questions could be answered in a truthful way, in an honest way, then at that point, would you consider stepping into faith for the first time or stepping back to faith? Because the way you answer that question actually shows how truly serious you are about pursuing truth. Because if you really are interested in pursuing truth, then your answer would be, you know what, if my question got answered, then I would go wherever the evidence took me and I would follow wherever it went me because I'm genuinely interested in truth. And if that's you, then that's great because I believe this is true. I'll write this down. Jesus will always honestly answer hard questions if they are asked honestly. Jesus will always answer hard questions honestly if they are asked honestly. Now, a couple of things I have to point out there just to, just to clarify something. Because you may be here and you may say, oh, well, I've had questions that I've never gotten the answer to. Um, three reasons why you may have never gotten an answer to a question. First off, it wasn't an honest question. It was asked with an agenda behind it. It was asked with you not really trying to pursue truth, but trying to affirm a lifestyle choice or affirm an action or affirm an attitude. Um, that may have been why. And see, Jesus is never going to engage, as we've seen through with this entire series, with a dishonest question, with a question that has an agenda behind it. So you may have asked a question that had an agenda, and we have to be very, very honest with ourselves about those because it's hard to see our hidden agendas many times. The second reason that you may have never gotten an answer is there was sin in your life or a next step in your life that God wanted you to take. And you might say, well, why would that have kept me from getting an answer? Because Jesus never takes you to next until you do what he's calling you to do, until you do what he's calling you to do 
now. Jesus never takes you to next until you obey what he's telling you to do now. So you may have had this question, but maybe Jesus was like, that's not an unimportant question, but there's something in your life that you need to deal with first. For example, for example, maybe as a teenager you were like, should I date this guy? Should I date this girl? And, 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 Jesus, and, I, and Jesus may have said to you through like maybe your pastor or through other people, hey, you know what? That's not an unimportant question, but you need to be a follower of Jesus first. And by the way, if you become a follower of Jesus, then the answer to that question will then become obvious. So maybe there's a next step that you have simply not taken. Jesus never takes us to next until we obey what he's telling us to do now. The third reason why you may feel like you've never gotten an answer, in fact, I think this is the most likely reason you feel like you've never gotten an answer, is because you just didn't like the answer that you received. For example, for example, you're a teenager or maybe a young adult or, or any adult, something like that, and you meet somebody, let's say you're single, and you're like, oh my gosh, he's so cute. Oh my goodness, look at that body she has. I would love to date her. God, should I date this person? And then all of a sudden, everybody in your life starts saying, I don't think that's a good decision. You really shouldn't date that person. You really shouldn't date him. You really shouldn't date her. Maybe you even come to church and you hear the message a pastor say something like, you should not be in a relationship with somebody who's not on the same level with you or the same trajectory as you spiritually. And then you come to the conclusion, you know what, I'm going to date them. And then your life becomes a mess because we've all made dating relationship mistakes, right? Amen. Amen. Yes. And then you go back and you're like, God, why didn't you answer me? And God's like, I spoke to you through this person, this person, this person, this person, this person. Everyone around you that said this was a bad idea, but you had already made up your mind that you wanted to date this person. So it wasn't that you did not get an answer. It was you simply did not like the answer you received. So you ignored it. Jesus will not answer your questions unless they are asked honestly with no agenda, no next step standing in your way and and you have to actually be willing to accept his answer. But if the question really is honest, I believe he will answer it. And the reason we believe this is because we see this play out in scripture. Mark 12:28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Now, this was an incredibly important question in that time, especially for the religious leaders. Because they had identified 613 different laws in the Old Testament. And they broke those laws into two categories. One category was the light laws, the ones that were maybe not quite as important. And then the other category, to quote Marty McFly and Doc Brown, were the heavy laws. Not in the sense of gravitational pull, but in the sense of their importance. And so there was this debate with the religious leaders. Which of the heavy laws is the most important? Which law is like the cornerstone of all laws. So they come so that he comes to Jesus with this question because he's seen Jesus give some other really great answers that have like stumped the other religious leaders. So he's like, well, I'll try this one, but we know it's an honest question because we see this happen. Verse 29, the most important one, answer Jesus. This is how we know it's an honest question. Because in no other exchange in this, in this dialogue between Jesus and the religious leaders has Jesus come right out and given a direct answer. He's either asked a question back or he's made some sort of observation back. And the point of that is to reveal the motive, reveal the agenda behind the question. But here there's no agenda behind the question. It's an honest question. And so Jesus answers it. And here, here's how he answers it. The most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now, I want to spend just a few minutes unpacking that because I believe that within this passage of Scripture it has tremendous implications not only for our lives, but also if you come in here very, very skeptical about the claims of Jesus, I believe it will do much to address your skepticism. But if you're on an honest quest for truth, I believe it will do a lot to point you in the right direction for truth. So, first it's important to notice where Jesus starts with the most important law. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In other words, God 
has to be your starting point for truth. God has to come before everything else. And you might say, well, why in the world does it have to be God? And it's very simply this. If you're really looking for truth, then you have to find a fixed point. And God is the only fixed point, so to speak, in all the universe. He's the only entity that never changes. We can't trust, for example, ourselves to be our own source of truth because we change. For example, how many of you are not sitting beside your first crush right now? Show of hands. Show of hands. Show of hands. Okay. Now how many of y'all are, ha- now, 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 how many of y'all praise God that you're not sitting beside your first, amen, hallelujah, I praise God that he delivered me from that potential evil. I'm so happy that that is the case. So we change, so we can't trust ourselves as our source of truth. We can't trust culture as our source of truth because culture changes. For example, when I was in high school and I was wearing shorts with tennis shoes, I would always wear socks that didn't even really come up above the top of my shoe. Yet now if you see teenage guys walking around with shorts and tennis shoes, they always wear these incredibly hideous calf-high black socks. Which, I don't care if you think they look cool. In my opinion, they look terrible. That's just my opinion. If I had worn these in high school, I would have gotten beaten up and mocked every single day. The point is this. Culture changes. And so you can't make culture your fixed point of reference. And you might say, well, maybe science can be my source. But see, science changes. In fact, scientific research and scientific discovery, the scientific method is built on the foundation of the idea that we don't know everything and there's just still more to know. Therefore, scientific theory and thought changes. For example, hundreds of years ago, people were convinced the earth was flat. Now we know that the earth is round. Science is changing. It has changed. And so that it cannot be your source of truth. God, if you're really on an honest, genuine search for truth, God has to be your starting point. And the, so the starting point of that is God, and then you're called to love God. And you might say, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Why should I love God? And the answer is simply this, because God gave himself completely in love to us. When Jesus said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, and then he says, love the Lord your God. It's bringing back to his Jewish audience this idea that the Jewish people were God's special, unique, chosen people. Not because of anything they had done, but because God in his sovereignty had chosen these people out of his grace. He had given himself to them completely, not as a result of what they did, but as a result of who he is. In the same way, God has given himself completely to to us through Jesus Christ. Not because of what we've done, not because we earned it, because we didn't, not because we deserved it, because we didn't, but because of who he is. We are to love God because he first loved us and expressed that love to us by sending Jesus to go to a cross to die for our sins and then come back to life so that if we follow him, we can be God's child. So we're to love God and then he he marks out what exactly it looks like to love God. First off, you're to love God with all your heart and your soul. In other words, loving God is to be this warm, passionate, emotional thing. Loving God is not the same thing as just standing here stiff with your hands folded. You sing the song really quietly and then the song ends and you say, amen. One of the beautiful things that has come out of Christianity in the last 30, 40 years, and it has its excesses, but, but some of the positive things has been this idea that, you know what? You can actually clap to praise God. You can raise your hands. You can be moved to weep if God moves in your heart. It is okay to show emotion. Reverence for God does not equal rigor mortis. Some of y'all came out of that background, and you know what I'm talking about. But it's okay to express emotion for God. In fact, think of it this way. If you expressed your love to God, or let me think of it this way. If you expressed your love to your spouse, the same way you expressed your love to God, would your spouse find you all that loving? Think of that. It's supposed to be with all your heart, all your soul, this warm, passionate emotion. But we have to understand, it's not just a warm, fuzzy feeling. Because you're also to love God with all of your mind. And that includes two things. One, what you allow to go on inside of your brain, inside of your thoughts. You're to honor God with what you think about. For some of you, they'll be like, oh, that's really, really scary. He can see your thoughts. Are you honoring him with your thoughts? But it also means this. We're to honor God in how we use 
our mind. Reason, logic, science, these are not the enemies of faith. God gave us a mind to use in order to pursue these things. In fact, I would even go as far to say this. Scientific research and medical breakthroughs and those sorts of things, these aren't the enemy of faith. God has given us the ability to use these things. In fact, in fact, science, like the modern scientific movement, that did not come out of academia. That came out of the church in the Protestant Reformation period. So it's not, against, it's not going against faith and against belief in God to actually use your mind. Following Jesus, this may come as a, as a really big help to some of you who maybe are on the fence and you'd really like to believe. It does not mean checking your brain at the door. In fact, guys like Josh McDowell, who we have a book, More Than a Carpenter, uh, written by him. You can pick that up at Next Steps. It's like three bucks. Very well worth the read. Uh, but guys like Josh McDowell and C.S. Lewis and Lee Strobel have shown that, that loving God, believing in Jesus, is not just blind faith. It really is an, a rational, logical decision based on evidence that we see in history, science, and philosophy. Loving God is not just blind faith. It's not just a feeling. It is also a mental and intellectual exercise. But it doesn't just stop at theory. You're also to love God with all your strength. This means loving God with your thoughts, with your words, with your actions, with the things that you actually do. And the primary way you express loving God with your strength is loving other people like you love yourself. You cannot disconnect loving God from loving people. Now, here's why that's very, very important. Because I believe for some of you, if all you saw from Christians were the fact that they loved each other deeply, even when they had conflict, and they loved other people deeply, and served other people, then I think for some of you that are skeptical, I think your skepticism would probably go away. Because you might say, I'm not sure that I understand everything, but I can look at the way they live and know there's got to be something behind it. In fact, I would even go as far to say this. I believe much of the skepticism against Jesus, against Christianity, is not fueled so much by questions, although there certainly is an element of that, as much as it is by observing the lifestyle of hypocritical Christians. Because let's be honest, the thing that causes people to question whether our faith is genuine is when they see us not loving our neighbor as ourselves. They see us not loving God with all of our strength because we say one thing and then we go do another. You cannot separate loving God from loving other people. But if we get our mind around that, in fact, I think for some of you, if you get your mind around that, that will change the way you see faith. That will change the way you see following Jesus. Because you'll start to understand that, okay, this faith thing, this belief in Jesus thing, this is not just go to church, get religious, do the right things. It's about a life-changing thing that happens in your heart that leads you to leads you to love God and to love people. In fact, the religious leader gets this, and this is revolutionary for him, verse 32. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbors yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, that would have been so incredibly revolutionary in that day and time. Because as a Jewish man, this man would have been taught from the time he was a boy that if you kept all the rules and you did all the sacrifices and you did all the offerings, then God loved you. Then at that point, you were acceptable to God. But here he's starting to see, based on Jesus' teaching, that you know what? Following God, believing in God, it is not about keep this list of rules. It's not about do this sacrifice. It's not about give this offering. It is about loving God and expressing that love to him by loving other people. And there's no way out of that. Now, now the flip side of that might be this. It's like, well, okay, if all I have to do is love other people, then as long as I'm loving other people, I can do whatever I want, right? No. You say, why not? 
Because if you really truly love someone, in this case, if you really truly love God, then you're not going to intentionally do the things that he hates. For example, confession time, uh, like Nicole said earlier, none of us are perfect, and so this is a great insight into the imperfect life of the imperfect pastor. Um, I have a really nasty habit, and if you're a dude, you've probably, you probably have or have had this habit, um, so ladies, don't get grossed out, but I hawk loogies. How many guys do that? Confession time? Confession time? Yes! See, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Now, men, how many of your wives found it thoroughly disgusting? Yes, my, my wife, like, like ever since we started dating, and I was able to hide it when we were dating because I'd run off to a bathroom and do it, but then when you get married, you start living together, and then all of a sudden, all your flaws come out. It's like, you do that? So my wife discovered this, and she's like, that's disgusting. I really would like for you to stop that because it literally makes me feel nauseated. And I was like, okay, I'll try, and then I wouldn't really try. You got husbands, you know how that works out? Your, your wife is like, can you not do this? And you're, you're like, okay, I'll try, which really is a translation of I'm really too lazy to actually make a decision to do it, so I'm going to say I'll try, but I'm not really going to try. That's kind of how that works sometimes. So I wouldn't really try, and then, it, but it finally hit me last fall. I was in the shower where lots of great ideas are spawned, um, and it hit me. If I really do love my wife, then shouldn't I be making every effort possible to not do this? Which was an uncomfortable thought for me. It's like, but I have this habit. It's like, but do you really love your wife? So I have improved. Grace will tell you I have improved. I'm not perfect, but I have improved. Why? Because if I love my wife, then I should try to do the things my wife loves and not intentionally do the things my wife hates. In the same way, if we really do love God, then we will do the things that God loves and make every effort to do that, not the things God hates. And it's not out of an effort to earn God's love. It's in a position of God has loved me by sending his son Jesus Christ to save me. Therefore, the only right way to respond to that love is to love God back and we reflect that love by obedience and that starts with loving our neighbor as our self. And I believe, for those of you in here who may be skeptical, if that's the picture of Christianity that you saw, I'm not saying your questions would magically melt away, and I'm not saying your questions are unimportant, but I think they would be somewhat lessened, lessened in importance because you would say, I'm not sure if I understand everything, and I know I don't have all the answers, but I can see by the way they live that there's really got to be something to this. And this is what the religious teacher of the law begins to understand. So Jesus responds, verse 34, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, there, there's something really, really incredible in that statement because Jesus just didn't simply say, hey, you know what? Great answer. Gold star. You get an A plus. Next. He actually said something else. He said, you're not far from the kingdom of God. The implication there is this. You're not there yet. You haven't stepped into the kingdom of God, but you're not far. Implied in that is an invitation for this man to ask one more question. The question would have been, how do I actually get into the kingdom of God? So Jesus doesn't just simply answer the question. He actually shows this guy his next step, which leads me to this idea right here. Jesus always shows the next step to those who want to take it. Jesus always shows the next step to those who want to take it. If you're on a genuine search for truth, if you are genuinely trying to pursue what Jesus wants you to do, then he will show you your next step. Now, for type A people, that gets frustrating because Jesus doesn't show us every single thing at the same time. Because I know for me, it's like, well, I wish Jesus would show me like all my answers like right now. But he doesn't do that. And here's why. Here's why. Because we could not handle it all. For example, for example, um, any Super Mario fans? And I'm not, like Super Mario fans? Yeah, I'm not talking like the Wii or the Nintendo 64. I'm talking old school Super Mario World, like the original or like the Nintendo Entertainment System with Yoshi. I'm talking that Mario. Now, here's the thing I know about Mario. You don't start off with Bowser at the first level. You start off with something stupidly easy that you can beat in about 60 seconds. But as you keep going, the levels begin to get a little more difficult. And here's the thing, as, as you go up in those levels, you can quit at any time. But if you're committed to actually getting 
to the end and rescuing Princess Mushroom or Princess Toad's Toadstool, whatever, then you'll continue going even if it takes you like three months to beat a level. Jesus always shows the next step, the next level to those who want to take it. And, and make no mistake, make no, no mistake, just like the levels in Mario get harder, our next steps with Jesus always get more difficult. Always. And Jesus will show you a next step that you honestly don't want to take. I've been there. I'm wrestling with that right now, honestly. But if you're really genuinely committed to pursuing truth, if you're really genuinely committed to going wherever the evidence leads you, to wherever Jesus' answers lead you, then you'll take your next step. Which begs the question, what's, what's the next step that Jesus is calling you to take this morning? Well, how has Jesus answered you? What next step has he implied in that? And what will be your answer? What will be my answer to Jesus' answer? Because he always shows us the next step. So how will we answer that? We, ne- we never know how this young man answered that question because verse 34 says, from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. No one asked him any more questions. But you know why? Because the religious leaders kept getting answers that they did not like. And so they said, we're, we're, we're done with this. In fact, the next time they asked Jesus a direct question, it was the night that he was arrested and put on trial. And they asked him, are you the Christ, the Son of God? And he said, I am. And that freaked him out. They didn't like that answer, so they had him killed for it. And I believe the only thing that will stop you from taking your next step with Jesus this morning is if you simply decide that you don't like the answers that you're receiving. Because here's reality. Truth is oftentimes very hard to hear. And there's no real way to sugarcoat that. It might be the truth that you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Christ and if you died you'd spend eternity separated from God in hell. There's not a, there's not a way to sugarcoat that. There's no way to sugarcoat it that maybe you're in here and and, and you're suffering from an addiction that you've kept hidden and you need help. It may be that your next step is you're here, you're maybe living with someone who's not your spouse. Man, you'll need to move out. There's no way to sugarcoat truth. Truth is hard to hear and many times we'll be in a place where we don't want to hear it and everything in us says, stop, that's too hard, I don't want to go there, but here's what you need to understand. Jesus said this, verse 38, uh, John eight thirty two. then you will know the truth and the truth, not our opinion, not our thoughts, not our preferences, the truth will set us Which means that what you need this morning in an answer to your question is is not something that makes you comfortable in where you are. What you need is truth, and ultimately truth is found only in Jesus. So at the end of the day, regardless of your question, as important as it may be, regardless of what maybe your next step is, what you need, who you need most, is Jesus. And if you commit to following him wherever he happens to lead you, even if it's a place you don't like, then he will he will set you free. It won't be easy. It'll be very, very difficult. Following Jesus is the most difficult thing you'll ever do, but it'll also make you freer than you've ever been.